Hello, today Colleen and I will be discussing cerebral spinal fluid with you, how it's formed, how it moves throughout the body, and why we care about it. So to begin, what is CSF? This is a quick down and dirty 15 second answer. This is just meant to give you an overview. Obviously refer to your books for any further details that we don't cover in this video. CSF is the pulsatile colorless fluid that bathes the central nervous system. It is derived from the exchange of plasma, water, and ions into the ventricles of the brain by the choroid plexus. And we will go into depth about this in about two slides. This photo might look familiar to you. These are the tubes used to collect CSF from a lumbar puncture or possibly a ventricular drain. So, where is CSF in the brain? Your brain has open areas called ventricles, which are filled with CSF. The CSF begins in the ventricles and moves throughout the system of the ventricles, down the spinal cord, and also through your subarachnoid space, where it is eventually absorbed. So you can see in this picture the system of ventricles, the lateral, the third, the fourth, and so on. So, the functions of CSF. It has several functions, physical support, control of chemical environments, transport, regulation, and excretory. So physical support. It surrounds and cushions the brain from any traumatic event. It is 99% water, which means it has a low cell count, and it gives the brain a buoyancy effect of floating inside the skull. The control of environmental chemicals and a transport of ions. There's a bidirectional flow of ions within the choroid plexus in order to form CSF. CSF transports ions, neurotransmitters, neuropeptides to areas of the brain where they may be needed. Choroidal cells have large Golgi apparatuses. With regulation, it is involved in maintaining blood and intracranial pressure. We've talked about the brain in a box concept before, and as you know, if ICP rises, or if there's an increased blood flow, the choroid plexus will produce less CSF to maintain the homeostatic state. Finally, it's excretory functions. CSF provides a path for excretion of metabolic waste, neurotransmitters, and so on, via the arachnoid villa at the top of the brain, and also possibly through your lymphatic system, which Colleen will discuss later. So the formation of CSF. This picture shows a choroid plexus and a cadaver. As you can see, it is within the ventricle, which is an open space for fluid to flow within the brain. The choroid plexus is sometimes described as a cauliflower-looking area. Although it is hard to tell from this picture, the choroid plexus is made up of an intricate system of capillaries which bring blood containing plasma into the brain to be filtered into CSF. Choroidal epithelium has a lot of mitochondria and large Golgi apparatuses, and we'll find out why this is important in the next slide. The pH of CF CSF is about 7.35, slightly more acidic than the body at 7.4 because it has a higher PaCO2 concentration than arterial blood. It's more acidic. Osmolality of CSF is greater than the blood because of the high levels of sodium and chloride that are pumped across the choroidal plexus epithelium, which we will discuss in further detail on the next slide. The total volume, approximately 140 mLs, is turned over about three times a day. It is a continuous process of formation, flow, and absorption. Formation happens at a rate of about 0.35 milliliters per minute, about 500 mLs per day, and studies have shown that you produce more at night. So get enough sleep so your brain is freshly bathed in new CSF to help you facilitate all of your daily activities and your neurons will be working in tip-top shape. Studies have also shown that CSF formation decreases with age. It's important to note that CSF is secreted by the ependymal cells of the choroid plexus. Now, formation of CSF. It occurs in two phases. So you see here, this is a picture of a choroidal cell occurring in the choroid plexus of the ventricles within the brain. The formation of the CSF occurs in two phases, and this is the basic overview. The first phase is movement of water and ions from the plasma to the choroidal cytoplasm, and that's from the basolateral side. The second phase is the movement of water and ions from the cytoplasm into the ventricles on the apical side, and this is where it actually becomes CSF. In this picture, the ions with the circles or rectangles represent active transport, while the ions with just the arrows, such as chloride, potassium, and bicarb represent antiporters or exchanges. So in a couple steps here, the first step is sodium uptake via the sodium hyd hydrogen exchanger and chloride uptake via the chloride bicarb exchange on the basal lateral side of the membrane. Then move into the cytoplasm, sodium uptake from the cytoplasm into the CSF via the sodium potassium ATPase pump. This is the primary force for CSF formation. 
This causes the amount of sodium within the cell to remain low as to create a concentration gradient to allow sodium to come in from the plasma side. So, this is the reason for all the mitochondria. If the sodium-potassium pump is constantly working to keep the choroidal cells low in sodium, they're going to need a lot of mitochondria to accomplish this. And think glucose here for energy. Bicarb is generated from carbonic anhydrase, represented as the circle with a CA in it in this picture, catalyzed by hydration of CO2. Sodium-potassium ATPase pump and carbonic anhydrase enzyme, which also regulates the aquaporin channel 1, are the two big players in this. Overall, it is the net transport of sodium, potassium, chloride, and bicarb, and water from the plasma to the ventricles. Tight junctions occur between the choroidal cells, preventing the movement of hydrophilic molecules and ions from passing between blood CSF passage. Okay, now we're going to talk about the pathway that the CSF takes through the brain. So it begins, as Shannon said, in the choroid plexus. And this is found mostly in the lateral and third ventricles. And for this purpose, um, for discussion today, we are just going to begin in the lateral ventricle. So CSF will traverse the two lateral ventricles and travel down the foramen of Monroe to the third ventricle. And from the third ventricle, it travels through the narrowest part of the system in the aqueduct of Sylvius to the fourth ventricle. From the fourth ventricle, it has two possible routes. It can go down the central canal of the spinal cord via the foramen of Magendi, or through two lateral apertures, or the foramen of Lushka, which are consistent with the subarachnoid space, starting at the base of the skull and moving up around the brain. And this is where um, the CSS, CSF excuse me, is absorbed into the arachnoid villa of the sagittal sinuses, right up here where it says SAS. So, as we talked about earlier, CSF is a pulsatile fluid, and its pulsations are continuous with the cardiac cycle, as you can see here from this picture. During systole, the vascular bed in the brain will expand, including the choroid, ple choroid plexus, causing the lateral ventricles to contract. Again, think about the brain in the box, Monroe, do or, excuse me, Monroe Kelly hypothesis. If one thing expands, something else has to contract. So this forces fluid down the foramen of Monroe into the third ventricle through the aqueduct of Sylvius and so on and so forth. During diastole, the vascular bed will contract, allowing the ventricles to expand and fill with CSF, and the cycle begins again. All right, so for absorption, the subarachnoid space is the area surrounding the brain, which lies between the arachnoid layer on the top and the glial membrane on the bottom. Absorption happens in the arachnoid villa of the sagittal sinuses, as we said, and these are protrusions of the arachnoid bordering the superior sagittal sinuses, where CSF is secreted into the venous system. The subarach subarachnoid space has trabeculi network that prevents the CSF from putting too much pressure on the brain parenchyma, as well as allows the space for the CSF to be absorbed by the sagittal sinuses. A second possible pathway is through the lymphatic system before entering the venous system. Absorption occurs along the cribriform plate and olfactory nerve into submucosal spaces. It may also exit via the optic nerve as well as other uh, cranial and spinal nerves into the lymphatic capillaries and onto cervical lymph glands. But for the majority of the time and for the purpose of this discussion, the absorption happens um, in the arachnoid villa of the sagittal sinuses. And this is just a picture just to kind of bring it all together, showing the circulation of the cerebrospinal fluid. So again, as you can see, lateral ventricle, Foramen of Monroe, third ventricle, aqueduct of Sylvius, fourth ventricle, and then it can either take the pathway um, down the foramen of Bajendi or foramen of Lushka down the, um, down the um, spinal cord or up around um, the brain. So that's that. <laughs> and finally, the viewpoint of the sRNA. So why do we care about CSF? What does it have to do with our everyday practice? 
And one reason that we really are interested in this is the concept of bericity. And what bericity is, is it's simply the density of a medication in relation to the fluid that it's inserted into. So for our purposes, again, we're going to discuss CSF, which is found in the subarachnoid space. And bericity can be compared to specific gravity in that it is affected by the influence of gravity. And the bericity of CSF is 1.004 to 1.009 and you'll see if you look through at different textbooks this will vary a little bit it might have a lower range 1.002 to 1.007 etc etc but for the most part it lies somewhere between 1.004 to 1.009 so for spinal administration the CRNA will be inserting medication into the CSF that is oftentimes hyperbaric which means that the medication has a higher density than that of the CSF, uh, or, or that it's heavier than the CSF. This is achieved by adding dextrose to the medication. In this case, the medication will have a sinking or settling effect if it's, again, hyperbaric. And this affects the spread of the medication, allowing it to be distributed um, to the lowest anatomic location of the spinal column. Conversely, if you uh, give a, hypo a hypobaric solution, it would have a floating effect because it is less dense than CSF, and this is very rarely used. And the third option is to give a solution that is isobaric, which has the same baricity of CSF. And the only time this is really used is if the anesthesia provider is going to add their own type of hypobaric additives. Um, but basically the take-home message for why it's important to CRNAs or how it's distributed throughout the CSF, um, it has to do with the density of the medication, so whether it's hyperbaric, hypobaric, or isobaric. The area of administration, so if you um, administer it on a low level of the, of the back as opposed to a higher level where the medication will spread and also positioning of the patient. So if you leave them in the sitting position after spinal administration or if you lay them down flat, where will that medication go? Um, so we must understand the nature of CSF in order to know um, how the drug will be utilized in the body. And that's it. I hope you enjoyed our presentation and thanks very much.